Well, hi everybody. My name is Cynthia Bauer, and as Greg just so nicely introduced me, I'm the founder and director of Cupenda for the Children. And as you see um, in the video, Cupenda is Swahili for to love, which was a very fitting name for our organization because a lot of the kids that we work with um, aren't loved because they live in a society where people treat them as if God not only has forgotten about them, but he's actually cursed them, and that's why they exist the way they do. And we do this through a variety of ways. Um, we help children by getting them into school. We do medical intervention. We help children of all different kinds of disabilities. We also do a lot of advocacy work as well, just to inform people that children born with disabilities, not only are they not cursed by God, but their very disability can be what God can actually use to display the work of his love in their life. We work with children that were born with things like spina bifida, uh, club feet. Uh, we have a large deaf population that we work with. We also work with children that have cerebral palsy. There's a large population of people with cerebral palsy in Kenya because of large amounts of malaria, which actually causes permanent damage to cause cerebral palsy. And I'm not going to talk too much today about Kupenda itself, but I'm going to give you a little bit of an intro. What I really want to talk to you about today is how these kids in Kenya, and kind of going along with the theme of what you're talking about in chapel, how these kids in Kenya really show me, and any of the people who've actually been to Kenya with me as well, that they show me a little glimpse of what the kingdom of God must be like. Because I know that I've never felt closer to heaven than I have when I'm surrounded by these kids. But before I go on, I'm going to give you a little bit more background on Cupenda. A friend of mine is actually writing a book about this organization and the formation of it. So there's enough about the formation of it to fill an entire book. So this is where we're located. I should have brought a little laser pointer. In the Malindi district, right there north of Mombasa, that's where we do our operations. And that's our little Cupenda office, um, right there on the coast, that orange building. And that's our director, Leonard Mbonani, who manages everything on the ground in Kenya. Um, we're very grassroots. We have about 10 staff now in Kenya that manage everything. We have occupational therapist, nurse, um, director. We have special needs teachers as well. But this is how it actually started. And I always think that Cupenda existing is God having a little bit of a sense of humor. I always think about that verse in the Bible where the, people are, the disciples are asking Jesus whether they're supposed to pay taxes or not. And Jesus, instead of pulling a coin out of his pocket, he like grabs a fish and pulls the coin out of the fish's mouth instead. I kind of think that's kind of what happened. Like instead of giving me a passion for special needs education and letting me go to school so I would learn about what I was doing or know about nonprofit management. Instead, I had a call to wildlife biology. I actually have a master's in ecology and an undergrad in wildlife biology and was a wildlife biologist for a few years. Was in Kenya doing my master's work, studying this weird animal about the size of a rapid rabbit called the golden rumped elephant shrew. So that's this weird little animal with a yellow butt that only exists and that's how God got me to go to this little part of Kenya. So now all the kids that we work with, all 600 kids in the 16 different schools that we work with, think that this animal is actually a blessing to them. And this is my field assistant um, up there in the forest with me, who is very key to the formation of Kupenda, because I had actually asked him about disabilities, and I had known from the year before that people with disabilities, when I'd been in Kenya, that they were actually viewed as cursed by God or they were forced to be beggars on the street. Only 10% of people with disabilities actually attend school, and that's all disabilities. They even are surprised, which doesn't make any sense when we think about it with our American minds here. They're surprised that I went to college, as if somehow not having a hand would actually influence that. So I was in Kenya and met these kids, and of course, before that, what also is one of the reasons why I was a part of this organization, why God called me to start it, is that I was born without my left hand. And these are my parents at 22 and 24 years old, and my mom's actually here today in the front. And I know that if it wasn't for their support and encouragement of me, then it's possible this may not have started. Because I know that there's other people in Kenya whose parents don't feel that way. I have met more than one parent who has actually killed their own child because of the way that they were born. And some of them are things like club feet, which can actually be corrected, but they didn't know that. And just this past summer, my dad actually got to go to Kenya with me. So it's the first time any, either one of my parents have gone to Kenya, and this is him with some of the kids. And of course, it was this hard journey for them too. 
um, when I was first born. They didn't know what to do. They were 24 and 22. I was their first child. But when I was a teenager, I asked for a guitar for Christmas. They gave me one without question and figured I'd learn how to play it, which I did. I don't practice as much as I should, so I'm not as good as I wish I was. But Kupenda started with about 15 different kids uh, that I just dropped by when I was doing my field work. And actually in this picture is my sister, who's actually in the front row as well, who came to visit me in Kenya just on a vacation and came with me to visit these kids for the first time. I was like, you know, there's a school I pass every day on the way to the forest to study this weird little animal. And I want to see what's in this school, this school for special needs education, this home where kids could actually stay overnight. And these are the first little group of kids that were there at the time. And there's a whole bunch of them who couldn't attend school because they couldn't afford the school fees or their parents didn't understand the necessity of it. So the person who had started the school, his name is Leonard, who is now our director, took me to visit some of these kids and I got to see them, took us some pictures of them, got their information, and before I knew it, people were sending kids to school. I think, yeah, go back one. So we went from 15 kids about 10, 11 years ago to now supporting about 600 kids in 16 different schools. It was not my intention, I will tell you that. My intention was to be a wildlife biologist and stay that way, but after a while it got a little bit hard. It's only in this past year that I've actually started to work full-time for the organization. Well, I shouldn't say full-time. I was full-time before, but now I actually get paid a little bit. But what I really want to talk to you about today there's so many different ways I could go with today's talk, and I was talking to Greg earlier today about some of the struggles that we have with the organization. Um, there, there's a lot of struggles even getting here. There was a lot of heartbreak, just personally. Um, there's a lot of financial stress, a lot of difficulty, a lot of people asking me, why would I quit this job that I had just three or four years ago to try to dedicate it to this organization? You know, my life was quite peaceful, it was fine. And people would ask, why would you put up with it? Especially when you're dealing with Kenya, you're dealing with corruption on a daily basis. We actually have people that accuse us of things often. And there are times I want to give up, it's true. And the thing that keeps me going, at the end of the day, when it's so hard, I just don't think I can do it anymore. When I'm tired, I'm exhausted, I feel like there's too much expectation on me. The thing that keeps me going are these kids right here. And anyone, like I said before, who's been to Kenya with me, could probably say a very similar thing, is to see one of these kids smile at you or hold your hand, or in my case, the thing that's really excited me lately is many of them are now able to say my name. I would tell you that there is nothing, better, there's no better feeling than that that I've ever experienced than to get to have that. These kids are broken and they're dirty and they're smelly but somehow they are the closest to heaven that I've ever been. And if you get a chance to ever go and experience it or go somewhere else where you meet similar kids, you'll probably see the same. So what I want to talk to you about are some of our kids. We have some kids that haven't made it. We have some kids that we could think about and kids that need to be helped and so forth that we'll never get to, but that's not what I want to focus on. I want to focus on the kids that have, and I'm going to focus on five or six of them. The first little boy is the very first sponsored child. His name is Cheroshida. And Cheroshida, interestingly enough, means journey of problems. And he was the first kid. He started the whole Kupenda organization. I went to visit him when I was with my sister that day at the school. And when we saw him, he didn't understand quite what we were there for. He is autistic and epileptic. He has seizures and also is deaf. So he wasn't quite sure why we were there. Our, Leonard tried to explain it to him and he thought we were taking him to school right away. Now keep in mind, I was just a grad student. I didn't really know what I was gonna do. I just knew I wanted to help in some way or another. So when he ran into his house to get his stuff to go to school right then, it just broke my heart a little bit. And I realized it's the first of many heartbreaks I was going to experience after this. So what I did is as soon as I got home, I sent the money for him to go to school. And he's been the child that I sponsored personally for the last 11 years. And since he went to school, he thrived. He was actually able to get a lot of his behaviors under control. He was able to learn sign language and communicate. He was making friends and learning. And his mother had actually abandoned him. When you see him in that first picture right there, his father had died and he was in the care of his grandparents who both were pretty poor and suffered from issues related to alcohol. 
So he was begging on the streets too. But once he improved at the school, his mom actually came back. This boy who was unwanted and neglected and left alone on the streets to beg was actually now being fought over by the mom and the grandmother at the school gate of who would be able to get to take him home. And I think that in and of itself is just amazing. What not that what God is like accepting us in our brokenness and restoring us in a way and loving us anyway? Uh, the next little girl is a little girl named Zahabu. Zahabu was another girl I met on the first day that I was there. The ones I met at first are the ones I know much better than some of the other ones today. Zahabu, when I met her, was being kept in the back room of her hut. Um, she was just laying on a cot. No one was ever moving her. She has cerebral palsy, which affects all of her limbs, both her arms and both her legs. Um, and she has spastic cerebral palsy, which means her arms move and her legs move a lot. And she had no speech either. She was also unable to swallow, and her parents couldn't figure out how to get her to eat. So when we met her, she was severely, um, they put that dress on her just when, because I was showing up. She wasn't wearing that before. And she was also covered in scabies, which are mites. So it was a pretty pathetic situation at the time. We don't know why she has cerebral palsy. Our guess is maybe it was malaria when she was younger, which is very common there. But we brought her to the school, got her cleaned up. She got her arms and legs under control with our physical therapist that we fund. She's actually able to swallow whole foods now. Uh, she can chew and swallow on her own. She has the biggest smile you'll ever see. And this little girl over to the right here, that's the Habu with her sponsor. Uh, we have a sponsorship program like Compassion International where people can actually pay for a kid to go to school for a year. And you can see just the smile that she has, just in the picture even, you can see how much it can light up a room. And anyone who's met her, would also remember her as volunteers in Kenya because when she walks by, even though she's still in a wheelchair, she does have some problems with her legs because she'd been left alone in that back of the hut so much without moving. Her legs actually, the muscles shortened and she needs to have some surgery. But she can actually say the names of all her family members now. She can say hello. And when I walk by, she always reaches out her arms a little bit unsteadily to reach out because she knows when I walk by, she wants to get a hug from me. And she just has that giant smile all the time. And again, that's just something, a feeling that's very difficult to describe. Another little boy named Happy, yes, that's his name. His name is Happy Kahindi. And Happy Kahindi, when he was brought to the school for the first time, he actually had charms around his neck which were given to him by a witch doctor because he also had cerebral palsy. The time that he came, this is actually, the first picture is even more healthy than what he was when he came. He wasn't even able to sit up straight. And as soon as he got there, the occupational ter therapist tore the charms off his neck, started working with him in physical therapy, and it was only a couple of years later that Happy was actually walking on his own. And there are more, I can tell you, there's at least five to 10 cases of children I have met personally when they weren't able to walk at all that are actually walking around today. And again, I'm just blessed to be a part of something where this is possible. It seems like miracles are happening all the day, all the time. Another boy named Mabruk Salim is a, was born deaf. 80% uh, of deafness in Kenya is preventable. A lot of people are deaf there because of impacted earwax. If you've ever, I mean, all of us have been a kid at one point. We all had ear infections, right? A lot of times it's just from ear infections that go untreated, or meningitis, and sometimes it's genetic. But Mabruk was born deaf, and at the time that we met him, he was actually quite a troubled boy. He had just come off the streets. Um, he was selling opium at like 10, 12 years old and was starting to get himself into a lot of trouble. And some of the teachers didn't actually want him at the school because he was such a troublemaker. And he was also a raised Muslim, by the way. It just so happened that at public schools, which are the schools that we support, they're supposed to have a Bible class for the Christian students and a madrasa, which is study of the Quran for the Muslim students. But it just so happens that the Muslim community is kind of behind on training people in sign language, so there was no one to teach the deaf students that were Muslim about the Quran. So Mabruk ended up going to the Bible classes instead. He liked what he heard, and his behavior actually dramatically improved afterwards. He eventually became a head boy at the school, meaning he's kind of like the big brother to everybody else, keeps them all in line, learns sign language, is actually now in carpentry school, and has plans to become a pastor. 
But before that happened, his father did threaten to sue us and sue the school and sue the chairman of our board, who happened to be the local pastor because of Mabruk deciding to become a Christian instead of Muslim. And in that meeting was his father and our, the local pastor and Mabruk. And keep in mind, his dad can't even communicate with Mabruk himself because he didn't know sign language. And the father basically got mad at us, talking about how we'd forced him. And the pastor just asked Mabruk in front of his father, he said, Mabruk, do you want to be a Muslim? And Mabruk, in the very dramatic way they do in sign language, said, I would rather slip my throat than be a Muslim. And he was really upset, and his father told him that he was forbidden from ever entering the church again. And Mabruk stormed off, grabbed five or six of his friends, and spent that whole night just praying with his friends, who all happen to be deaf. And if you ever get a chance to see a large group of deaf people praying together, it's also really, really beautiful because of the expression that you get to see. And Mabruk, if you ever get to meet him, and all the volunteers who'd come before got to meet him, and he just has this kindness about him, just being in his presence. He's so patient, he's so sweet. And it's, it's crazy to think that he was once selling drugs on the street. This is another little girl named Terezia. It's not so little anymore. She actually was in that video. She had a tree fall on her leg, and she was in a coma. Um, her leg was amputated way, way high. And her father had abandoned her, and she was left to be with her single mom, who was often sick and couldn't afford to send her to school. We actually had a sponsor who happened to be a close friend of mine who decided to sponsor her, not just through elementary school and high school, but he sponsored her all the way through college, and she just graduated. And she is now interning with us for Cupenda for the Children. She has a degree in community development and social work. And I don't have any children myself, but I feel as proud as I think most parents would be if they saw their children being as successful as Terezia is. Her last name, Zawadi, actually means gift in Swahili, and she's been an amazing gift to me. And she, she and I are actually friends. As we're driving along, sometimes I, I get lost a lot. I'm like, Terezia, I don't know which way to go. Is, are, are, is this the right turn? She's like, Cindy, surely you are joking. <laughs> I'm like, no, I really don't know where I'm going. <laughs> But she is a spitfire. Um, like I told you, we have a book written, being written about the formation of Kupenda. She has her own chapter, actually, in this book. And she'll get really upset and worked up talking about how people will think, just because she doesn't have a leg, they'll say, oh my gosh, it's so amazing how you can cook so well. And she's like, I have two hands, it's just my leg. <laughs> and finally, the last child I want to mention to you is one that I have met more recently. Um, this is a little girl named Joyce Wanjay. Now, in all this time as I was doing work in Kenya, I never once had actually met someone who was born without her left hand or without a hand like me at all. And it just so happened I, happened, I was in, the, in Kenya doing work, and I happened to be in the office. Now, I need to give you a little bit more background on why this was personally significant to me in addition to the fact that she had a similar disability to me, is that at this time when I'm in this office, I was actually supposed to be on my honeymoon. I had actually been engaged to be married five months before that, and this was the week I was supposed to have gotten married, and I'd broken it off about five months before. And I was still kind of dealing with that whole heartbreak of everything, trying to figure out, you know, when you go through heartbreak, you kind of question everything else about your life, and I'm wondering, is this Cupenda thing really worth it? Is this what I'm supposed to be doing? Would I be married now if it wasn't for Cupenda? It just so happened a midwife came to see us when we were in the office, and she told us that just a couple weeks before, there had been a child that was born, and she was born without her left hand, and the mom refused to come out of her house because she was afraid that she'd done something to cause this to happen. And keep in mind, this is only 2009, just a, few years, just a couple years ago. And so we called the parents and the child to come in the next day and met with them. Again, they didn't know that I was there at that time. It just happened to happen. And I sat there and got to hold this little baby as our director, who's way on the left, and the pastor, who's way on the right next to me, was talking to the parents about the fact that this wasn't something that they had done. It wasn't spiritual in nature. And he also started to tell them about me. And he'd talk about little silly things, like the fact that I can tie my shoes, or the fact that I could tie a skirt around me, and I can type faster than him, and I can drive, and he can't drive. 
And she later, and then he also talked about the formation of Kupenda and how it's possible that if I hadn't been born without my left hand, then maybe this whole group of kids wouldn't have been helped. And so the mom left saying, "No, now I know this isn't something that only happens to Africans, which is what she thought. This only happened to Africans and not to white people." She said, "And now I know my child can function in society." She's like, "Well, maybe my child can also help other people in the way that Kupenda has been helped." I went to go visit her about six months later when I was back in Kenya again. Oh, and before that, the biggest part about this whole experience for me personally, getting to meet little Joyce, I remember just thinking in that moment it was that peace that transcends all understanding had come over me. Is that it was a reminder to me that God really was in this whole Kupenda thing, and if He was taking care of this little girl, He was also taking care of me. And if it was only this little girl and not the whole other 500 or 600 kids that we helped that I had come here to help, then that would have been enough, actually. And I just wondered about how her life would be and what would be affected as she went along through her journey. I came back to visit her six months later, and we interviewed her for the book that we're writing. We interviewed her parents, sorry, for the book that she was we were writing, and we talked about, you know, what are the things you think your daughter will be able to do or not do? Now, keep in mind, someone without a hand doesn't really need any special assistance. So we were just visiting more just to make sure the parents were treating her in the right way. Well, they're like, yeah, well, we think you know she'll have to go to a special school one day because people will make fun of her. We convince them, you know, you really shouldn't do that because kids get made fun of no matter what. And we said, and my friend asked, like, well, if you can't, if you think she has to go to a special school, like, what else do you think she can't do?、I'm、like, well, she probably won't be able to carry water around her head, which is a very important thing to be able to do as a young woman, and she probably won't be able to grind corn, which is another very important job for women in Kenya. So my friend looked at me and she's like, "You know what you're going to have to do, right?"、I'm、like, yeah. <laughs> so I picked up. I had never carried water on my head, and so I'm like, before I picked it up, I'm like, just so you know, in case I can't do this, it's not because I don't have a hand. It's because I've never done this before. But luckily, I was able to do it.、Um, also shows. I also showed them that I could grind corn. You can see I had a little audience. I even think I started to tap dance just for fun. And last summer, my dad actually cut to come and meet little Joyce too, which was really great. She's at that age where she actually hates me because she's like two, but hopefully in a couple of years she'll be liking me again. And finally, I want to go back to the first little boy that I mentioned, and it may seem strange to end with this, but I think it's actually fitting. So Cherishita, like I told you, means journey of problems, and he's. Has been my sponsored child for the last 11 years. Now Cherishita, no longer,、um, is just experiencing a glimpse of heaven. He's actually in it fully himself, because just this past summer, in June, he happened to pass away from multiple seizures through the night, and it really is the hardest thing that I've had to experience so far. Because, like I said, he's the first one, and he was mine personally. And he used to always come greet us at the gate when I would come. He would come and take my bag. That was his big thing. And keep in mind, he was autistic, so we didn't have like a gushy relationship. But he would always take my bag, and he would always make sure all the kids lined up appropriately to take pictures. And he's a kid that really, if it wasn't for him, who knows what would have happened? He was the one that started it all. And the timing of his death was what I call sorrowfully providential, because I already was planning to bring a group of 16 volunteers to Kenya with me, and I was actually able. To go and be a part of the funeral service, the family and the school all knew that he was my personally sponsored child, and they asked me to give the eulogy at this funeral. And there was something, as much as it was sad, there was something beautiful about being able to be a part of this, to be able to mourn with the the children. And my friend Becky, who's sitting up in the front, was actually able to be there with me. And I told her the night before, I'm kind of worried, you know, with everything I'm dealing with when I go to this funeral. What if I'm not able to be emotional? Like, what if my emotions are all on hold? But I went through, and as custom in Kenya, you have wailers, people that all surround the coffin of the person that's died. Who, that's their job, is to basically wail. And as I went in, it was quiet, and they actually lifted up the flap of the coffin where you could see his face. And as soon as I saw his face, I just burst into tears, and then everyone else burst into tears around me, wailing. And it kind of hit home to me what was really, really happening in that moment. Like I said, I was able to read the eulogy. I did it in Swahili, which was quite taxing for me to be able to read that whole thing. But it was just still a beautiful experience to have, and that they really mourn well too.
But Cherishita, it's not sad anymore, I don't think. He's passed away, he's gone on to a different place. His life is better in the 11 years because of the assistance that God has enabled us to provide to him. And he's now in a place, in what I said in the eulogy, where the lame walk, the blind see, there's no sorrow, there's no more pain, and he's completely and totally surrounded in the peace and love of God, and there is no greater gift than that. And Cherishita has actually sparked us in his death to start a school in his name, and so we're hopeful that in the years to come, we might be able to do that. So just because his life was, his life was the beginning, but the end of his life was not the end of Kapenda. And like I said, Kapenda is much sorrow, but there's so much joy. It's what I always call, it's kind of like an extreme graph. For every dip, there's a higher joy, and it just keeps going up and down like that. And I would say I could live just an even-keeled life, but that'd be kind of boring. I, wouldn't get, I might not have the pain, but I know that I wouldn't have the joy. And with all the children that we lost, there's all these other children that are saved. And we know that it's the right thing to do, and God has completely blessed me by being able to be a part of that. And I just thank you for letting me to share a little bit of my heart with you today. And for some of you who are interested in Kupenda for the children, any of you guys who are interested in going to Kenya or interested in helping us, on this side in the U.S., we have 10 employees in Kenya, but I'm the only one in the U.S., okay? So funding all these kids takes a lot of work. And we have had interns, and I don't know if Emily is here or not. Uh, we've had interns come with us to Kenya and also have worked here in the United States with us to help with fundraising. So if you're interested in nonprofit development, if you're interested in any kind of community development or advocacy work or special needs education or anything else that you think somehow fits with what we do in Kenya, please feel free to come and see me. I think we're going to have a meeting afterwards for people to come and talk to me. There's brochures in the back, and you can always just feel free to email with me if you can't make a meeting later, and you can always get in contact with me through either Greg or actually Becky Dowling, who works in the finance department. So thank you very much. I appreciate the time. <laughs>